you should have wildlife in your garden. And I know that's running contrary to what some of you might think, especially if you've got deer and rabbits that are causing problems. I'm talking about the animals and the insects that can actually promote a healthy environment and make your plants perform much better. Hi, I'm Gardener Scott, and I discuss everything gardening so that you can become a better gardener. And my garden is a certified wildlife habitat. I'm quite proud of that. And in today's video, I'll show you how I did it, give you some ideas of encouraging wildlife in your garden, and help you in the direction of maybe having a certified wildlife habitat too. I'm always encouraging gardeners to have wildlife in their garden and to actually encourage that wildlife to come. It's not only healthy soil and healthy plants, but a healthy natural environment that really makes our garden perform at its best potential. I have videos and during some of my live streams, I bring up some of the topics, some of the things that you can do to encourage that wildlife. But even then, it can be a little confusing. It's kind of hard to get all the pieces put together and to know exactly what you need to do. Well, that's where the National Wildlife Federation comes in with a checklist for their Garden for Wildlife program. My garden is certified. Now, you don't have to be certified, though I encourage it because it's pretty easy. But you can go online and download their checklist to give you an idea of what needs to be in place in a garden setting to best promote wildlife. And it just comes down to a few things. The wildlife needs food, it needs water, they need some type of cover or shelter. They need a place to raise their young. And ideally, if you're doing it right, it's a whole bunch of sustainable practices to keep the environment healthy. The National Wildlife Federation's Garden for Wildlife Certification Checklist tells you everything you need to know to prepare your garden. It has the categories, food, water, cover, places to raise young, and the sustainable practices that you need in your garden. And then it gives you lots of great ideas to figure out what the individual components are for your garden. This is a new garden for me. This whole space is less than a year old. And when I moved into this house a year ago and began planning this garden, I did so with the wildlife in mind. Every component from the vegetable garden to the fruit trees, I had that eye towards the wildlife and how I could work as a partner with all of the life around me. And it included each of those pieces in the checklist from the National Wildlife Federation. Let's begin by discussing food. This is one of the easiest things you can do in your garden to encourage and promote wildlife. And it's things that you're probably already familiar with. You may already be doing it. It's things like putting up bird feeders in your garden or squirrel feeders. Most of us really don't like squirrels in our gardens, but others of us do. And if you put up a bird feeder or a squirrel feeder, it's definitely going to attract some of that wildlife. And as you think about the food for your wildlife, think beyond just the summer months. Think year round. For my birds, they need to eat during the winter, but a lot of the food isn't present. So that's one reason why I put suet feeders in my trees, just to help the birds out during those cold months when a lot of the natural and native food isn't present. And you can grow most of the food that the wildlife is going to need. It's a lot more than just bird feeders because there's a lot more wildlife besides birds. So having flowers are a great source of food. Pollen and nectar feeds a huge number of insects. And not only does it help you attract pollinators to your garden, but it gives an opportunity to increase the wildlife because they have food with your flowers. And you really don't even need to work that hard in getting food to your wildlife. In these undeveloped areas of my garden, I'm just letting the native plants grow. 
and flour. And they're providing a great source of food to a lot of my native insects and even the rabbits. It's no work at all. Very easy option for you. The water source can be very easy too. If you live next to a stream or a lake or a river, it's already there. There's no work involved. Now, if you're in an area like mine, that's much drier and we don't have a lot of those natural water sources, it does require some planning and maybe some building to put water into your landscape, like I've done with this little solar powered fountain. This is a great source of water for insects and birds in my area. And I've already seen a huge amount of interest in this water with the birds attending every day. And the water source doesn't have to be something fancy like a solar powered fountain. It just needs to be water in a pool that insects and other wildlife can access. I have a video that shows how I made this nice little bird bath from a leaf, but it's really more than a bird bath. It's an opportunity for insects of all types, including butterflies, to land and just take advantage of the wet surface and the little bit of water that's pooled in the bowl. The water source doesn't have to be permanent. Something as simple as a kid's pool during the summer will often offer enough water for insects, birds that are using the pool when your kids aren't. In the winter, you do need to consider that the animals still need water. And so you could go as far as having a heated bird bath or just bringing out some fresh water on a regular basis to give the wildlife a source of water that they need. You should have an area that provides cover for wildlife, a shelter from predators and weather. It doesn't need to be fancy. It can be an area like this. I can hide here and make it difficult for you to see me. Well, the same holds true for the wildlife. They can hide in a brush pile and escape a predator that might be chasing them. Or they can hide in a mature tree that also gives them the opportunity to escape. And it also holds true for the weather that we get, sometimes severe. Just being underneath a brush pile or in a tree can be enough to save some of the wildlife that can be pummeled by severe storms. A pile of logs can offer great protection. If a pile of branches or a bunch of logs doesn't match with your style of gardening, well then go ahead and stack the logs. Make a wood pile that you're going to be burning in your fireplace or your fire pit. But when you look at it, you'll be able to see a bunch of spiders. And they're almost always good spiders. Well, where there's spiders, there's other types of wildlife as well. You can combine a lot of these requirements. Near your water source, go ahead and put a frog house or a toad house. My son recently sent me a picture of a toad actually using his toad house. When positioned near water, those type of animals, that wildlife, has just about everything they need. To garden for wildlife, you should give that wildlife a place to raise their young, like this bee house. And I've recently seen a lot of interest. There are some bees that are finding it. It's new. I expect it to have a lot more activity next year. But this gives a few bees a place to lay their eggs and raise their young. Birdhouses are a great idea to build and put into your garden. And this birdhouse saw a lot of activity earlier in spring. A lot of the areas that can provide cover for the wildlife might also be a good place for them to raise their young. Brush piles are a great example of that. And when you get to know the wildlife in your garden, you'll understand their needs. And so you can plant and grow accordingly. Like right here, I have some butterfly weed growing. Well, this is a type of milkweed. And milkweed is the only kind of plant that a monarch butterfly will land on, lay its eggs, and then the caterpillars will eat. So these plants are specifically being grown for the caterpillars and ultimately the butterflies. 
there are a number of things you can do for the sustainable practices that are necessary to encourage and promote a wildlife habitat. One of them is soil and water conservation. And if you've seen any of my videos, you've probably heard me talk a lot about mulch. I mulch my beds, I mulch my pathways, and this is a great way to not only enrich your soil if you're using organic mulches, but save water in the process. If you live in an arid or a semi-arid region like I do, you're probably familiar with the concept of xeriscaping or water-wise gardening. The idea is to use a lot of native plants and mulches and prepare the soil so that the plants won't require a lot of water. We need to save water in my region. And one way is through the landscape. That's what I'm doing in the front as I develop this area of my yard. I'm growing a lot of native shrubs and plants like Echinacea and Monarda that will do well without requiring a lot of water. I'm not only benefiting my landscape and my wildlife, but all the rest of us as well as I save water. Included within the sustainable practices is the controlling of exotic species. And one of the best ways to do this is with native plants because your native plants will attract your native insects. And that'll help push out a lot of those exotic species that might move in. If you saw my video on integrated pest management, that's a great method to not only control the insects within your garden, but also deal with a lot of those exotic species. Another great sustainable practice is to garden organically. And I've talked about this in a number of videos and had some specific videos focused on these ideas. It's doing things like composting your kitchen and your yard waste. It's avoiding the use of chemical pesticides and chemical herbicides. Just gardening more naturally, organically. And by doing these type of sustainable practices, you will benefit your wildlife because a lot of those synthetic chemicals that we use can be very harmful to wildlife. If you garden with wildlife in mind, you're creating not only a more natural, but I think a more enjoyable gardening experience. And the National Wildlife Federation is just one organization that promotes this, but I think they're one of the best. I encourage you to do all these practices that I showed you to help me get certified. Now, this sign, I got as a result of a contribution to the MWF. You could just get a certificate or you don't even need to apply at all. Just do these practices to make your garden better. Below, I'll include links to not only the other videos that I've referenced, but also how you can become certified as a wildlife habitat. I think it's one of those little things you can put in your garden and most people won't even care about it. But the people that know about it, will actually think you're doing a wonderful thing for the world by growing for wildlife. I'll also put a link below to the checklist of those different things you can do within your landscape to promote wildlife. And by gardening with wildlife in mind, I guarantee you that you will become a better gardener. And to also help you on your journey, consider watching one of these Gardener Scott videos. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.